it looks like we're live. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, I guess, yeah. So Adrian is going to be teaching this semester. So I'm going to be taking over hosting the seminar. So today, this is going to be our intermediate period. Um, but yeah. So uh, today, we'd like to welcome Martin Eckstein uh, to give us a talk on the ultrafast dynamics and symmetry broken phases. Um, so yeah, with that, go ahead and get started. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm, of course, happy to contribute to this uh, seminar. And yeah, so and thank you also for the invitation. So um, yeah, my talk will be about dynamics in solids. And uh, probably you know this, but let me nevertheless say that uh, experimentally using ultra short to sec laser pulses, one can really probe nowadays the dynamics of degrees of freedom in the solid, uh, starting say from really the femtosecond dynamics of electrons to dynamics of collective order small and picoseconds. And this is really a great way because from this we hope on one hand we can really by looking at the dynamics learn about the interactions of these degrees of freedom in the solid and possibly also by driving the system out of equilibrium, reach new states that not that are not directly accessible in equilibrium. Yeah? And I will, in today's talks on one aspect of this, namely uh, the dynamic symmetry broken states, in particular, uh, most of the examples uh, to the dynamics of charge density waves. And charge density waves have been really studied quite deeply in this context, simply because this is a nice example where you can probe both the order parameters, say it's a lattice ordering, for instance, using X-ray diffraction and also the electron dynamics using both doubles. So let me start now in the to, uh, to, set, to set the stage to kind of review experiments that highlight the uh, theoretical questions that uh, we would like to address here. The first one is a rather old experiment here, I would say, but still very nice experiment in which one probes directly the charge density wave order using X-ray diffraction by looking at a peak that's sensitive to that. And um, yeah, following an electronic excitation, just a short uh, laser pulse, one can, in this case, see coherent oscillations of the order parameter in this case, yeah? And I put this example here because it's really an, an example uh, or, one can interpret the dynamics nicely within a phenomenological ginzburg landau theory. Now, in this approach, the order parameter here written follows an equation of motion where the force is given by a free energy potential. And the idea is that this free energy potential depends on the electronic temperature and on the time scale on which the dynamics takes place here. Uh, the electrons are nicely described more or less by, a, <coughs> by an effective temperature the uh, increases after the pulse, decreases afterwards, and changes, therefore, the shape of the potential and the coherent dynamics. And depending, for instance, when the uh, excitation is strong enough um, and transiently, the potential becomes uh, like uh, has only one minimum, then the dynamics would show overshoots and so on. Now, this quasi thermal interpretation is quite nice, but of course, from a theoretical point of view, it really like to also see whether there are situations when such a quasi-thermal uh, interpretation is not true at all. And one such experiment is the second one, which here, this was done uh, a year ago. And in this experiment, it was really uh, probing both the electronic state using ARPES and simultaneously the lattice using X-ray diffraction. And uh, from the electronic uh, state, one extracts kind of a rough, uh, like from the distribution of electronic temperature, and the results are really summarized in this plot where the uh, charge wave order is plotted here against the measured electron temperature. And then one really sees as uh, the system is excited, the electrons heat up, the order melts, and then it kind of comes back here and uh, relaxes and recovers. Now, the key point is here that the recovery really happens at a stage when the measured electronic temperature is still far above the equilibrium transition temperature. So whatever, if you use a um, effective ginzburg lander potential, you would definitely have to use a potential that's uh, a non-equilibrium potential. Yeah? And now it starts to become theoretically interesting. You can ask, 
which degrees of freedom are here out of freedom? As for instance, is it true that even the electrons cannot no longer be described by an effective temperature, or is it other degrees of freedom that uh, are in, in a non-equilibrium state? One set of degrees of freedom that's probably not like really in equilibrium are spatial fluctuations of the order parameter. And that's what I would like to show here in this next uh, experiment. So what I mean by uh, spatial fluctuations, of course, order parameter always so far, we talked only about the homogeneous, especially homogeneous order parameter has fluctuations around. And these fluctuations, uh, spatial fluctuations, you can also measure, for instance, by tracking uh, in a diffraction experiment, uh, diffuse peaks. And this is just a very nice recent experiment for a material that has uh, two competing orders or charge density ordering along two uh, directions. And one can see uh, while in the equilibrium state kind of one is dominant, in the transient state, you can see fluctuations of both. And the theoretical question that you can ask here is now really, um, uh, do these spatial fluctuations here, which are really not in equilibrium, renormalize the free energy uh, for this mean order parameter and therefore influence the dynamics? And this is really a theoretical uh, viable path, uh, as I will show it during this talk. Now, talking about fluctuations, I would like, I, you can say that there are two quite opposite scenarios, how fluctuations affect the dynamics or how they become manifest in the dynamics. Yeah? And I illustrate this here schematically by uh, an order parameter, which describes some yeah, staggered order parameter here that could be a staggered charge density or anti-ferromagnetism. So the conventional scenarios that you would excite the order collapses, so then these uh, kind of dis displacements here all oscillate around zero and then they um, recover. But you see that the local like displacements here are all nicely represented by the mean, yeah, and just show small fluctuations around that. And as a response, you would see the order parameter as here, like collapses and recovers. The computer scenario would be the following, where kind of after the pulse, these local displacements still stay at a finite value, but they just become random. And then as the dynamics comes back, they reorder. Yeah? And as the average is no longer uh, representative at all for the individual fluctuations. Yeah? Although, if you just look at the dynamics of the average, it would be indistinguishable. And this is the scenario which I call the disorder scenario, which I would like to discuss here also in, in the talk. Yeah? And uh, indications of that, or like really the, this, this physics has been seen in two nice experiments here by uh, Simon Wall and others in VO2 and also in this manganite system. And uh, yeah, so that this would be indistinguishable in terms of the average, but uh, it should be true that like this disorder really could have a profound effect also on the dynamics. So in, for example, it could possibly be first stage to meta states or rather slow dynamics. Also, it's true that ah, uh, if you have such a disorder, it will have a strong effect on the electronic structure and uh, uh, that should also be visible in experiment. And uh, from a theoretical point, of course, uh, investigating this is challenging because we really have to track to keep track of a joint evolution of the electronic structure, which is inhomogeneous and also the inhomogeneous order parameter. And this is what I address here. Okay, so um, in terms of microscopic theory, of course, there is a lot of interesting results and, and very nice results which have been done. Many of them, I have to say, are really based on the assumption of a homogeneous order parameter. In particular, this relies to all theoretical approaches or most which use time-dependent mean field theories or even uh, time-dependent dynamical mean field three or Keldish perturbation theory. And there are a lot of interesting results which I want to discuss here. So if uh, your reference is not on this list, uh, which uh, is uh, definitely true because I miss uh, many references, this shouldn't be a problem, but really the aim is here to investigate how we go, how we include the role of fluctuations and inhomogeneities on the dynamics. So for the rest of the talk, I will mainly cover this from two perspectives. One is a phenomenological theory. Yeah, it's basically Ginsburg-Landau theory, but including these fluctuations. 
Then the second part is the theory for this ultrafast disordering, which will be from a microscopic point, of, uh, from a microscopic perspective. Okay. So let me start with this phenomenological picture here. And here, what I write down is a most general, like Ginsburg Landau potential for an order parameter that has uh, n components. So it's a vector like order parameter, or you can say uh, competing orders or whatever. And it has, of course, a quadratic term, which is a quadratic function of, this, uh, of these fields. Then it has a, a fourth order term, which I in an isotropic way here, and possibly a linear term. And then in particular, it has these uh, fluctuations, which is here written in terms of the momentum dependent uh, uh, order, order power and uh, a gradient term here, yeah, proportional to momentum squared. And now, if you want to study dynamics with this, one way of including dynamics is, uh, of course, we had uh, time derivatives. And uh, if you look, uh, one, one way of doing this is to look at the overdamped limit. Just uh, take a first order time derivative, uh, which is basically here uh, given by the derivative of the free energy with respect to the field. But then this is basically damping. And in order to make it uh, consistent in the sense of statistical physics, you also have to add a stochastic noise term here. And this is taken to be delta correlated noise. So this way of introducing a dynamics is what is suggested as model A in this paper by Fornberg and Halperin of classifying dynamics as phase transitions. This would still would already be like a, a stochastic differential equation would already be a formidable theoretic. Now one can make a lot of uh, one can make some progress, of course, by saying it and treating it in the Gaussian approximation. And the Gaussian approximation it means that you assume that the distribution of the order parameter field is always a Gaussian around some mean. And that means you only have to evolve the mean, uh, the average, and the fluctuations. And you can write down differential equations. And there, of course, here, the differential equation for the mean is basically the uh, derivative of the order parameter is given by a force here. That, and it's a, some message anyway, yeah, okay, is, is given here by a force. And if we would have just the quadratic term, of course, this would be this matrix here times the order parameter. And then you see that there are contributions uh, here, which come both from linearity. They come because if you take the derivative, you will have it was like expectation values of third powers and then these you factorize using the Gaussian approximation. So this gives rise to uh, kind of non-linearities, but also you have contributions which come from the fluctuations, yeah, from the momentum average fluctuations. And these, so the, the fluctuating back on the dynamics of the mean via the non-linearity of the potential that you would like to look at, yeah. So you can also always interpret this if you like the dynamics in terms of a, a, a new potential just for the mean value of the order parameter, which is however now modified by the presence of fluctuations. So this type of uh, like dynamics or this way of, of treating it, as I think uh, there's a very nice paper here by uh, Pavel Dolgerev and also Eugene Dembler and others, which uses this for the isotropic order parameter. Yeah, So really for more or less a phi for theory and the dynamics is introduced here by like making the prefactor time derivative. You switch the potential. The, this is the prefactor of the quadratic terms. You switch it from uh, yeah this way to the way here, and then you switch it back. So this is the picture. You heat up the electrons; they come back. And if you solve the dynamics uh, without any fluctuations, you would see a collapse of the order and the recovery. Now. If you already, however, solve the test of the fluctuations, you see that in this uh, initial phase here, also the fluctuations shoot up. And then if you take into account that the fluctuations actually renormalize the potential, then the renormalized uh, quadratic term here um, is restores something much closer to the uh, unsymmetry broken state, so to this flat potential, and therefore traps 
the order parameter for a long time here close to this minimum. So the dynamics, including the fluctuations, really has a very slow recovery with respect to the other term, or in other words, the um, order parameter, the, the fluctuations here stabilize this ordered state. Yeah. Okay. So this was a this is a nice what we ask ourselves is now if we have what is probably a common situation in meta systems if we have a, a multiple order parameters that interact with each other and the potential is not isotropic can we also really modify the shape of the potential create new minima and and play around with that so <clears throat> and a, a generic situation where you would have such uh, a non isotropic potential is uh, orbital order. So here you're looking at uh, orbital order for two orbitals, or EG type orbitals on a cubic lattice. And uh, the way to look at this is you have here, uh, so you can you can be in one of these orbitals, like the this one of these two EG orbitals, or of course in any linear position. And these linear superpositions are in particular the orbital elongated along the z-axis, along the x, or along the y-axis. And if you derive a typical orbital exchange model, then what you can get from it are models in which uh, the preferred ordering along the z-bonds, like in z is orbital, like the same orbitals in the z-type uh, orbital and the y-orbital in this and the x-orbital in this. And now what you can do is you can take this model and kind of coarse grain it, replace the uh, orbital pseudo spin here by a two component order parameter, and you get your Ginzburg Landau potential, which is now no longer like uh, isotropic. And it has, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not writing down this potential in detail, I think it would not help much here. But the key thing is that now all these parameters are explicitly given in terms of these exchange couplings. And if you are in equilibrium, and this is the key point, and you have no fluctuations, you know, just this local part of the potential, then the minimum would be an orbital order where this ordering is basically isotropic. And it's only due to the presence of the fluctuating term that uh, this gets reduced to discrete minima reflect the cubic point group symmetry. And that thing, uh, or that effect is basically known, it's called order by disorder, and kind of this ginzburg landau functional which we use is one uh, like phenomenological representation of this Ginsburg of this order by this disorder. And then of course, uh, since the fluctuations are already crucial in determining the like shape of the potential in it, it's uh, um, interesting to ask all of these fluctuations if we go out of equilibrium. Yeah? And this was motivation for, for the work here. And now, Oh, should I come step by step? So now, um, uh, let me go one back. Okay, sorry, I'm. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems I. It seems they got one slide lost. I'm sorry. Why? Why can that happen? Okay, let me try to explain it. Um, so uh, what we have. But now we have to introduce a dynamics and uh, let's the following the uh, the uh, potential depends, of course, on the exchange interaction along the three bonds. And now the idea is that using external fields, you can actually change these uh, interactions along the three bonds. And this is uh, similar to like you can always change the microscopic parameters of a model uh, using external fields. There have been several proposals for it. One is, for instance, using a, a floquet type modification of the, uh, the external of these parameters, where if you like have uh, apply an electric field, an oscillating electric field along one bond, then which, uh, the uh, um, uh, interaction along that bond gets reduced by an interaction that depends on the C and the amplitude of this field. And uh, this is what we use by motivation here to study what happens if you introduce in this way a few percent modification of the field. And uh, I missed one intermediate slide, so I'm sorry. This is a bit, uh, there's a bit of a jump here. In addition, we also have uh, here uh, a temperature pulse, yeah, that uh, as before basically uh, brings the 
that quadratic part of the potential more from uh, this side here to this side transiently. And then we can whether if we start in one of these minima, actually switch to the other. And such a switching is really possible, but it's uh, in, in all this, if you analyze it closely, it's actually crucial that you take into account this um, uh, renormalization of the potential due to the fluctuation on the one uh, mainly. So this would be a typical trajectory one starts in order parameter space. Then basically due to the, the trans uh, heating, it gets reduced. And then due to this uh, change of the uh, interaction along one bond, you kind of twist, uh, like make it asymmetric and then you bring it over to this, but uh, other minimum. And then it would basically relax to the other equilibrium minimum. But it's really crucial to keep these uh, fluctuations because <clears throat> uh, if, you, uh, if you keep these fluctuations, it's prolonged. You have a prol uh, uh, the um, kind of state stays uh, for a longer time, is stabilized close to zero, where you need a much smaller force uh, and change of the interactions here to switch it. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry there was something missing. But let me summarize this part, which I anyway just wanted to discuss um, quickly. So really, it's an example where at least on a phenomenological theory, you see that the forces of uh, these fluctuations, which arise from these fluctuations, are important uh, if, to consider if you want to con non-thermal orders. Um, what I have not yet found here is, which is an interesting question, is whether really by uh, populating these fluctuations, you can stabilize a new minima. You can come up with a few models of that type, but nothing which I at the moment uh, find yet uh, very realistic. So it's more fine-tuned. And uh, okay, for future also another question is whether there's microscopic theory on that. And yeah, so with this um, brief overview of this, I would now come to the second part, which as I said, is about this mechanism of ultrafast uh, disorder. And here we use a very simple uh, model for a charge density wave, which is the so-called Holstein model. Holstein model is just a model for tight binding electrons here hopping on a lattice. You have a dispersionless phonon, or one oscillator on each side, and this is linearly coupled to the density of the electrons. And we take a half filled system, so it couples to the deviation from the mean density. You could also take an interaction. Uh, this is not so important now for what I uh, discuss. And if we are on a bipartite lattice here with sublattices A and B, um, model will show a symmetry poke and state where you make a cut, like on the A sides, the uh, on the sides, the displacement will be in positive direction. And on the other side, the displacement will be in the negative direction. And this is a standard second order phase transition where this order parameter here just continuously goes to zero. Yeah. Okay. Just a, just a this, short question. Or can yes. I ask a short question? So, uh, sure. the, when he says piles, usually people think of charge density wave as a thermal surface instability, weak coupling effect, but uh, the Holstein model is typically used for polaronic effects. So, yeah. is, is, is your discussion including the polaronic effects? Well, that, that's a good question. So, uh, the same model on a bike. Lattice would also show the weak coupling mechanism yeah? sure, uh, and sure. the nesting because on a sure. bipartite lattice at half filling, the Fermi surface right, is nested. Right, yeah, right, right. Um, the method we later on use basically it should work uh, with, with its approximation for both limits. Yeah, but you okay. moment, I think you, we don't have to specify this. Yeah, okay. I, I thought for a moment but, that you're restricting your discussion to the weak coupling scenario, but you're not. Yeah, so it's not necessarily, I would say. Okay. Yeah? okay, thank you. So, and now we have, yeah. And and so of course this state of course is seen in the electronic spectrum. So in, in so uh, actually, if you look at the, uh, in the normal phase, you just have a like broad band. So this is the spectral function. And in the uh, ordered phase, you're opening a gap. Yeah, and also the spectral function then becomes asymmetric between the two sublattices with a like on each sublattice, of course. So the A sublattice here would obviously be which has a larger occupation. Yeah. And now we want to study this model, like the dynamics in this model topically. 
So we could use dynamical mean t because it's a strongly interacting model. So the idea of DMFT is that you take the lattice model and you map it to effective impurity model yeah, in which one side of the lattice is here embedded in a fermionic bath. That means it can exchange electrons with this bath and this bath is described like by its hybridization function. So it's that of the bath density of state. And from that model, you would like to calculate the Green's function. And then uh, in DMV, the bath here is self-consistently given by the Green's function. So that's uh, in a nutshell DMFT. Now, how this self-consistency looks like uh, depends on the lattice you look at. Now we can take the simplest lattice, which is a so-called beta lattice. It's always used uh, nicely for model calculation DMFT because there the self-consistency on one side is basically given by the hopping to the neighboring sides. This is this J, the Green's function on the neighboring side. Yeah, so the side zero and the hopping back. And then you have to sum over all neighbors. So kind of it's a very nice also pictorial representation that this hybridization represents the environment of a site in the Okay, now uh, the non-equilibrium version of DMFT uh, has been formulated here by uh, some authors and we are using that to study dynamics. That's basically the reformulation of all this on the Keldish framework. Now DMFT can be used, of course, to study the symmetry broken state in a quite natural way. Yeah, so we would assume translational invariance in the sense that now all sides are equal. Uh, just we have a distinction between sides on the A and B subletters. Yeah, okay. But we assume that the properties on A and B subletters are the same on every side. And if we do that, then we have, in in the language I explained, two coupled impurity models. For a site on the A lattice, okay, uh, the neighbors are all in the B lattice. So the environment is given by the B Green's function and vice versa. And then you have to couple these two and that will give you uh, like a spatial mean field, but still dynamical uh, description of the uh, physics. Now solve this uh, impurity, yeah, which is a, a Holstein impurity model, like an oscillator coupled to a fermionic continuum. And that we can do in the simplest way using a mean field decoupling or mean field decoupling of the interaction term. So the interaction, electron phonon interaction is kind of whatever. We have here G times X times N minus. If I decouple that, that means I have a force on the phonon, which is just given by the um, expectation value of the electronic density. Okay, and time we have to deal with the atoms, the electrons in terms of the self energy. Now see uh, this part here, which is kind of uh, the mean field action of the phonon displacement. So it's a staggered field, which will be responsible for opening the gap. And then you can also take second order contributions, which basically describe the interactions of uh, electrons with phonon fluctuations, yeah? And these interactions, for instance, will lead to the fact that in the normal phase, the spectral function, this invisible fluctuation, the spectral function gets heavily broken, and the first term opens the gap. Yeah, and then also you can keep some phonon back action on the phonon to make the theory energy conserved. And that's something you can relatively easily implement. And actually, this is an advertisement slice here in between. I'm not talking about how you solve these Keldish function techniques, but if you want to learn, you should probably look at this uh, computational uh, physics uh, school and maybe apply it because maybe this might be the first summer school corona to take place live and you uh, should apply soon. There will be lectures on this uh, Keldish numerics, but yeah, this is what would come out. So uh, we are using here a short impulsive excitation of the electrons and then you really see uh, what we basically saw qualitatively in the simple Ginsburg landau description, oscillations of the orbiter around a finite value. Yeah, if we make a large quench, oscillations around zero. Yeah, so it's a microscopic description, but it's very well in agreement with this time-dependent Ginsburg landau picture. Also, I have to say the order parameter doesn't recover because the theory is energy conserving. This would change if a thermal heat bath to it. Yeah. 
but just one, uh, sure, just, now, yeah, just one, one short question uh, also yeah. not to clarify so so this uh, treatment of phonons this is not exactly classical phonons right basically if you just took the first term it will, it will, boil, uh, it will boil down to essentially the classical phonons right yes that, that's uh, true uh, how big how big are these quantum effects i mean because treating classical phonons it seems that the Orlando Ginsburg, time dependent Orlando Ginsburg, is some, somehow is a classical treatment of, of, yeah. uh, of, of the other parameter, right? So, so, so how big are, why? I mean, it's much simpler to treat, to, to treat uh, phonons classically, obviously. Yeah. But how big are the quantum effects in your opinion? I, I think they are quite, uh, quite subtle. So if I would just have a time dependent theory, in particular, I think the damping of these oscillations would be very mm -hmm. different. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I haven't, I haven't, I don't have it on the plot here, but they might be largely under. Uh, on a quantitative level, the effects are quite, quite large. Right? Mm -hmm. In particular, what concerns the, yeah. yeah. Okay, but now we really would like to, to try to ask, can we induce a spatial inhomogeneity? And what that means is we are now try to give up this idea of translational invariance. And this is what has been, called a statistical DMFD in the context of uh, equilibrium and has been used widely to study disordered models. I mean, the, the use of DMFD for disordered models goes back to work of Janisch and Folhart. And uh, here's an overview of a several different ways of treating that actually we are more or less uh, using now for the non-equilibrium relatively simple variant of that. Yeah? And what that means is, as I said, we give up the translation invariance. So we have formally a different impurity model for each inequivalent sites, and formally all sites are inequivalent. Now on the beta lattice, in the limit of large coordination, so meaning you have many neighbors, okay, the environment more or less is an average over all neighbors. So what that means is that eventually we expect that the properties locally to fluctuate and to vary, but then for the environment, there is a self-average and we replace the environment by its average. Or in other words, our numerical setup is now that we have to solve like a large number of impurity models. In our case, it will be like 250 or whatever. And uh, the half of it represents the A sublet. Uh, and that's actually, yeah. And, and their environment is given by the average of all the Green's function on the B sublet is and vice versa. Yeah, so that's the simplest way in which we can introduce in this formal especially the effect of real spatial inhomogeneity. Now, now we want to do an extra thing. We don't want to only use the mean uh, decoupling for the phonons because that is also the lowest order and there will be effects beyond that. So let me say what that means. Mean field meant we have this interaction and we decouple it. So in the sense that the electron Newtonian sees the average uh, of the lattice displacement and vice versa. If you would go beyond, that means the electronic, the phonon dynamics should also see fluctuations, time-dependent fluctuations of the electron. Yeah, So time-dependent density fluctuations. And if you include them in a classical equation of motion, you have to, what you should include is on the hand a damping term, yeah, which we know very well that the phonon coupled to electrons should have a damping. So this is basically proportional to x dot if in the simplest way. But if you include damping, you also should include a stochastic force. Yeah, and in which sense the whole dynamics becomes a stochastic dynamics for the form. Now, this seems ad hoc, but of course you can derive uh, how these damping and stochastic terms on the next order would look. And this is what I'm not going to do in detail. So you can derive them from the Keldish formalism. So. Uh, for instance, if you want to really read, uh, that is a very nice book by Kamenev, which uh, introduces this. And um, at least in an approximation where you also treat the electrons as fast against the phonons, um, you would see that the uh, noise is a white noise. Autocorrelation function is given by the spectrum, determined by the spectrum of the density density fluctuations of the electrons. That, that's what it should be because the phonons interact with the density. So the noise should be derived from the density density correlation of the electrons on the same side. And the damping is given by the retarded Keynes function of the density density correlations. Okay, 
And so what you now have to do is you have to propagate the electrons, extract these density correlations from them, use them to determine the statistical like distribution of the noise, uh, draw your samples of the noise, propagate the phone. No? So that's what we do. So one word about maybe where this noise comes from, I don't want to derive it, but uh, at least I want to give an impression. Um, if we would really solve the full problem, yeah, electrons and phonons, and we would like to look at the expectation value of some phonon variable, we would do it in the path integral formulas, and you have to sum over all paths of the electronic variable and over all paths of the phonons, however, on a Keldish contour, yeah, on this, because we are treating a non equilibrium problem. Now, if we would have a classical trajectory of the phonon, in that sense, that would mean we have on the electrons just a time dependent force. And on the Keldish tour, this means that uh, the, the phonon on the upper and so the phonon uh, trajectory on the upper and lower contour is uh, the same. Yeah, it's, that's its classical trajectory. And if you would take a sta the stationary phase of the action with respect to that, we'd end up with a single classical trajectory, and that's the mean field decoupling. Now, what we are doing here is essentially uh, what I would call a semi classic approximation, which means we try to retain all possible classical paths. And in order to weight them, we take into account Gaussian fluctuations around the difference of the classical trajectory on the upper and lower contour. And this is precisely the way in which you derive these semi-classical. But that's only for someone who is more into Keldish. Let me come to the result. So it's equilibrium. And here I'm really showing you these uh, 250 trajectories the ones for the A sublattice and B sublattice color coded over a time frame in the stationary equilibrium state. So we have to prepare a state, we have to propagate for a while to become stationary along this picture. And of course, in the normal phase, all them uh, fluctuate between uh, plus and minus, so it's blue white. Yeah. However, if we decrease the temperature, they start to break the symmetry in the sense that the A trajectory is fluctuating around something negative here and the B around something positive. And you can take the average now and plot the average as a function of temperature on the A and B to get back your nice second order phase transition. Yeah? So that's the first uh, reassuring uh, thing. And the other thing is you can also now look at the electronic spectra in this picture. This would be the normal phase. And this is the spectrum we get basically by taking the average of the local spectra. And it is some broadened picture here of the, uh, the non-interacting state. Let me say, if you would do a mean field decoupling of the phonons, that you would have a single trajectory in a normal state, the electron spectral function would look precisely like this. And the nice thing is if we do this completely different approach of a perturbative uh, solution in DMFT, we get the dashed spectrum. So actually the semi-classical approach is not that far. The fluctuation, how they act on the electrons is, uh, seems to be quite well represented. Of course, both schemes are approximate, but since we are in the high temperature phase, we assume this weak coupling approach here to be quite accurate. And so this is kind of reassuring. Now, if we go to the symmetry broken phase, then that would be our uh, from the semi-classical approach, so the gap is opened, spectra are also broadened by the presence of fluctuations. But of course, here, uh, this uh, semi-classical and, and the weak coupling quantum approach is not really the same, I would say, since they probably uh, represent the, the district that already shows that the distribution of fluctuations is not that simple anymore, because in the quantum approach, you really keep phonon fluctuations only to second order. Okay, now we go to the non-equilibrium. Let me say what we mean, how we bring it out of equilibrium. We would simply try to take the initial state and more or less impulsively transfer a population from the lower to the upper band, and then treat the electron dynamics, including, and that's important here, also a dissipative path, which makes sense because we really want to propagate for long times and it uh, would be unrealistic to treat the electron, the electrons and this particular lattice mode to be ice. So then 
that's uh, what the electronic distribution function would look like. Initially, it's a Fermi function. And then we, for a short moment, couple some electron reservoirs, which basically pump in electrons at high energies and dig out electrons at low energies. This creates this initial non-equilibrium distribution. And then both to the coupling to the phonons and to the coupling to this heat bath, uh, it relaxes back on a time scale of a picosecond or so if the bandwidth is an electron volt and, or something like this back to the Fermi distribution. You can also measure something like the excitation density, which is the integrated electronic distribution for positive energies. This shoots up and goes down on a femtosecond. Okay, but now we are interested in the phonon variables, how they behave. And that is again, the same with the kind of individual trajectories, E to the A. And what you see that for a short time, so actually what, you what I showed before in this previous slide was the one picosecond, and that's kind of down here. On the short time, the order collapses. So you see these white parts here, and then it recovers. Maybe it's better to look at the mean here. On the A sub lattice, for instance, you start negative, it collapses, stays shortly around zero, and, and since it recovers randomly, it recovers here to the other side. But the key point is, if you look now at the individual trajectories, they are very different from the mean. For instance, this is one of the trajectories here, and you see that it really flips more or less from minus two to two, and then stays there, yeah? It is not following the mean. And there are other trajectories like this one here, yeah, which really is transiently for a very long time trapped in the wrong minimum. So although the majority of the sites on A is already on plus, it's trapped on the side. And there's another one which transiently flips over. Yeah, okay. So the phenomenology which we see here, that of the transiently generated disorder, namely that the individual trajectories are really not well represented by the average, or in other words, would have these rather long lived, you could say, meta effects, which you get. And <clears throat> you can also look at the phonon distribution function. This I find quite illustrative. So really the full distribution function of the phonon displacements. And there's a little movie. Um, it shows like initially it's on the, yeah. So maybe, oh, so that's uh, here it seems on this iPad, I, I don't know how to move back. So initially it's a uh, peaked around negative. Then you see quickly, it becomes very broad. Basically it's completely disordered and then it restores, but it restores in the sense that the mean here is still around zero, but it already has a well-developed double peak structure in the sense that they are, point, they are either plus or minus. And then it reforms the order by kind of healing these defects. There's some well, kind of... So this is exactly yeah. the Polaronic regime, where they, what people call the Polaronic regime, where you have a bimodal distribution of displacements, but no longer enjoy them. But this bimodal distribution is really generally transiently yeah and then right. no, I, 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 I understand but, but this is what people say you know like in the old theory of Milis, uh, he says i'm not going to break the symmetry but i allow for the displacement to take two different values and yes. the, you can think of it as a randomly placed polarons which are kind of slowly moving around but this and, is exactly yeah. what this is right and this is what you get here transiently and then it right. heals out yeah right so right. it's really what you generate because the, 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 the polarons they can form a periodic lattice or not yeah, if yeah, you can put it like this, yeah, and if you uh, yeah. So if I model this, I wanted to say, uh, I, I would like to, I would come to this later. So uh, if you study, for instance, uh, quantum Monte Carlo solution of the equilibrium state, yeah, and you go very close to the phase transition, you also see bimodal distribution, like indications of that bimodal distribution. But here, transiently, you really them transiently. And they give rise to very long-lived dynamics. And very you nice. can now also try to like in, give some interpretation, more or less a bit along the lines which you have. If you have these two states, you can ask yourself whether you can put up something like a potential with two minimum, which describes them. So this would be the potential describing the local displacement. And since there is a favored state locally after the system has already moved to some symmetry broken 
state, I draw this asymmetric. And then you can ask, what is the rates for flips? And if you would just say, okay, the rate for is kind of Arrhenius uh, behavior. I, it's, I'm not saying that this is, is true. I'm just interpreting my data in this way. Then you would say the rate for left is uh, measuring kind of the potential energy difference from left to right and vice versa. And then you can take the data, which I just showed and measure kind of these flip rates, how often they flip yeah, from side to side then extract the barrier height. And it's also kind of illustrative because it shows that while the distribution is still like, yeah, while you are still in this like uh, on average symmetry broken state, you see that the barrier forms. Yeah, so from this point, the polarons, if you like, uh, can be metastable, they're protected. And then uh, as the system heals, the barriers become asymmetric. Yeah. And why is there so no tunneling under the, through the barrier? What about well, the tunneling the question whether we keep that correctly in the metastable uh, in, in our semi-classical approach, uh, that's to be discussed, yeah. Um, also, it's the question whether in the temperature regime we are, it would be dominated by tunneling or, uh, or like thermal fluctuations, but it's of course a good question, which I uh, can't answer from the data we have now, yeah. Okay, so um, I think I'm coming close to the end. Uh, this was the story, at least just that if you do time dependent simulations here for this uh, Holstein model in DMFT, keeping the inhomogeneity, we really see the ultra fast generation of the disorder. And you can read in this apps, in this archive article. Uh, from an experimental perspective, I think that's interesting because it's like uh, might be this disorder is something that is addressable using uh, scattering experiments, and that's what FELs are good for. Also, it should be visible in terms of incoherent spectral weight in the, uh, in the electronic spectrum. And if you look for in some experiment, which I don't claim a related Holstein model, but anyway, it's for example, an experiment on photo excitation in uh, this tantal disulfide, which is also supposed to be uh, a, like a charge density wave. You see, which is called excitation continuum, which is basically a background that's generated. And I don't know how much of this uh, could be related to dynamically generated disorder. Also, from a more abstract point of view, say this uh, uh, is actually an example of uh, uh, where you sell, where a system which has no extrinsic disorder generates disorder. And then the question is if the electrons would also show localization in this disordered potential, you would be, would be an example of disorder pre localization, but this is a, a bit far fetched, I guess. And what comes next is, of course, we'd like to extend this to more realistic models and so on. And uh, with this, most important thing, of course, to thank the collaborators. This was a work which was a lot of fun to do with uh, Francesco Grandi, the postdoc in my group. And uh, very sadly, today was his last day of work. He is now moving to Aachen to Dante Kennis. And Antonio, who did this as part of his PhD, he will be there longer. And then a part of the theoretical foundations were also uh, worked here with Chai Chen Li, a very good postdoc who is now in PSI and Christopher Stahl. And another advertisement, uh, actually I'm moving to the University of Hamburg, which is a place for ultra fast science. And I will be there starting from October, 2020. And also there will be uh, positions open. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, so yeah, open the floor for questions. Um, so yeah, you don't have to raise your hand, just unmute yourself and you can just talk. So, um, assuming that that is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Can I maybe uh, make a short comment? Uh, yes. Uh, about uh, this first model, you considered about a uh, model with three orbitals. Uh, uh, it's not about your main topic, actually, not about dynamic, but model itself. Uh, it's actually more complicated than you considered. We just uh, suggested this model very long ago when we looked at orbitals. Uh, when you have a long Z direction, a long Z bond, you have uh, Z square, Z square orbital, long X, X square, X square, long Y, Y square, Y square. And uh, you can model it by this, uh, I think, like model, but I think uh, with SD, SD along Z direction. Yeah, this one. 
and not x at x and uh, x direction y y and y direction we call it compass model and this is extremely complicated actually it's it's not solved by this order by disorder that discussed in uh, some mathematician looked at it in very many details in two decades in uh when you complete it, that's uh, gave rise to this kitai model that's a version of this one but in three decades in cubic lattice uh, there were a lot of studies and that's described in very big details in uh, uh, review of modern physics uh, of Zahar Nusinov and Jeroen van der Brink. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not really uh, reduced to disorder by disorder. It's more complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's no, thank you for the, for the comment. I mean, as I said, we took kind of this uh, model here as a, we, as a kind of motivation to write down a simple ginsburg landau theory that features yeah, this order by disorder mechanism in the sense. As yeah, I said, actually, the... my comment is not directly related to what you did, but simply model itself uh, seems to be richer and more complicated. Just look yeah. at this in uh, modern physics by Nusina and Van der Brink. Yeah. Uh, about okay. compass models, compass in Kitaev models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? If no one else wants to speak up, I just wanted to make another comment. It is very, uh, first of all, thank you for a very exciting and interesting talk. I didn't know that this all this can be done. It's, it's spectacular. And I think there's a lot, really a lot of, so many interesting things, especially the slow relaxation that, that, that was found. This is really a, something that it's not at all obvious, but it's very interesting. Um, uh, I wanted to just ask, uh, about, uh, well, these transient states in some, that you described, in some sense, these are some kind of non-periodic states. And you can think of them as, a, well, you know, these are just, you know, the system is wandering through the space, phase space, but these are not necessarily uh, metastable states. On the other hand, uh, you know, if the, especially in systems we have enough frustration of some kind, uh, usually uh, without disorder, they can be uh, uh, lowest energy states are periodic, but there are metastable states which are not periodic. And these metastable states may not be long lived, uh, but you know, in some cases they are. And for example, you mentioned tungsten diselenite and similar things that were studied by Mikhailovich. Dr. Mikhailovich has a very lengthy review article on those uh, dicalcogenites. And, and, and he, put, he actually has beautiful experiments where he, you probably know the work, blasted, there's a polaronic, uh, a star of David polarons form this triangular lattice in a periodic case, but you can blast it with a laser and then cool it quickly, and then it gets stuck in this amorphous configuration. Now, mm -hmm. they it suggests that in addition to polaronic effects that you're including here, uh, they um, they also included the long range Coulomb interaction, which kind of uh, you know then affects the way how these polarons are influencing each other and which which pattern they assume. So the point is that um, we've also done some related work on motor organics in the past. The point is that when you have uh, additional interactions, which may be longer arranged, then, uh, then, then they're really, you know, these amorphous states may, may not really just be some transients, but they could actually be long lived. And mm -hmm. maybe the system can actually even freeze. And for non-equilibrium dynamics, these states should play a very big role uh, in, in, of a glossy character. So I, I think there is a lot more that probably can be discovered along these lines. Maybe if you add some additional Say a Coulomb interaction, long range Coulomb, or something like that, that will become even more uh, apparent. I just, that's just a comment I want to. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, this is a very important comment because in the in the current uh, 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 solution, of course, we really have access only to this polaronic type of dynamics because of on the beta lattice we have lost the information on the like real long range spatial correlation. So we cannot add the Coulomb interaction. This would be something that, that would be nice to take into account once we try to repeat uh, similar things on uh, more real models, which of course is more, more challenging and something for the future. But then I, 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 I like this, uh, this work by, by Dragan. And they do this classical Monte Carlo calculations for the Star of right. David's arrangements uh, under the Coulomb interaction. It's quite nice. Yeah, so, and By the way, you know, I, instead of doing this, uh, you would you call statistical DMFT in, on a real, uh, like a square line. This is very, very difficult, of obviously, right? Especially with the Keldish and all that. But, uh, but I think that there is now, in fact, we have had some papers in the past. You can, instead of that, doing 
what you may call EDMFT with replicas in, in a Parisi way which is then a, a local, you know, you don't have to work in really in real space. You can describe basically the distribution functions of, for example, this P of X distribution is something that can be self-consistently determined and that can be done also for the Coulomb glass, for example. So I think that there is a way to do something that's not really so much in real space, but then we'll have to use an EDMFT type of description okay. for the other parameter. So I think there, there is a way to do that in a, maybe in an accessible way. Uh, Gergely Zarand has done some work along these lines mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. If you use kind of, if we do a decoupling and then use EDMFT for the order parameter uh, yeah. field, that, that sounds like interesting, yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. Should. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very, very nice talk. Hey Martin, this is Noah Brayali. Yeah, hi. Hey. So I want to pick up, if we could, on that the the theme you touched at the very end about localization, and yeah. bring bring in this um, idea of the the like a fat tail, you know. Mm -hmm. So we think about a, a, a distribution in terms of moments uh, when the when it's basically a Gaussian with a little bit of you know a little bit of um, maybe you got a second moment or third, fourth moment or something. But mm -hmm. there's another kind of conceptual possibility that comes up when we think about localization, uh, like many body localization, has been studied best in, in, uh, in kind of an energy space in uh, kind of cartoon models like the Ising model in one dimension by Fisher and going back to Ma and Dasgupta and, and Patrick Lee in the 1980s. Uh, but the concept is something like this, that you look at those 250 sites, right? Mm -hmm. And we look at the distribution and the, the kind of, the feeling is that we should, the distribution will have like a bump, which is the thing described by all the finite moments. And then a fat tail that will, uh, like formally, the, the way it's described in mathematics, you say it has an infinite second moment that has an infinite mm -hmm. variance or infinite disorder. That's the, the, the jargon that uh, Fisher and, uh, okay. and others use for this kind of, line, this kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and so the, uh, the connection that, that came to mind with this last part was that perhaps this, um, this uh, fat tail uh, is what could generate the localization that you're seeking. And so then mm -hmm. the, the process would be something like, rather than coupling to the mean, right? Or, or I mean, actually, when you have a fat tail, mm -hmm. the mean wins. The, 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 the yeah. mean is dominated by the fat tail. Then you look mm -hmm. at a typical site, and it won't be the, uh, it won't be the, the these rare regions that are dominating the, um, the average. Okay. And so th mm -hmm. this is, and I came to mind uh, thinking that maybe localization could come from looking in at that distribution of those 250 sites. So I, the question is, what does that distribution look like? And um, uh, you know, what kind of tails have you, uh, can you identify in the distribution for those 250 sites? Well, I, I think uh, like looking at the distribution functions here in this, uh, like what I showed in this, uh, in this movie, unfortunately, it seems when I show it on the iPad, I can't uh, stop the movie, right. but I think we definitely have not the statistics to make statements about uh, long, long tails here. I, I would, I would not put my my hand on that. I mean, the, the most important feature is I like this strongly non-Gaussian bimodal distribution, yeah. but along the, about the long, the tails at large X, uh, I think we can't say at the moment. I, mean, I, I also don't, there maybe, maybe an equal, so that would be probably something to look first uh, if uh, you study the model in equilibrium using DMFT, and then you can use Monte Carlo to solve the impurity problem. And then you can also look at the equilibrium local mm -hmm. distribution functions close to phase transitions, of course. And there, one should probably have a better statistics on the, um, uh, on the tails and maybe analyze this, yeah. But yeah, I, I haven't seen also any uh, works that uh, propose like, basically divergent moments, di divergent uh, moments at, uh, of one order. Yeah. But also, I don't know whether this has been analyzed. It's, it's a good point. Yeah? So here we don't have the statistics at the moment, I think. There's another thing you might, one should be able to say. Uh, you know, you talk about localization. Localization needs phase coherence, which can be easily destroyed by, um, by time dependent for example, the time dependence of the potential. So, you know, uh, people usually said in the old days that, well, you know, you, you need quench disorder for localization. It's not so easy to localize. If you, if it starts to move around, then, well, you know, 
is not going to localize because you, you for forming bound states you need the standing wave mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so that's actually an interesting question because various people uh, uh simone fratini and sergio chuki have proposed for motorganics that uh, phonons uh, a large amplitude phonon motions which are found in motorganics they actually can use some can, can lead to some transient localization but but these mm -hmm. calculations don't really properly treat the phasing, I think. So, mm -hmm. so you know, that's a, 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 a tricky question. How, how much is your dephasing or, or incoherence, you know, affecting the localization? And that may depend, for example, if you replace this potential X by a time independent value, well, that could, you know, uh, ignore uh, this dephasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, why is to say within the approach that we're doing now within this uh, statistical, uh, uh, DMFT uh, type approach like this one, I think uh, we wouldn't have the spatial coherence properly to make statements about localization. Right, right, right. This uh, is actually CPA what you're doing. Yeah, this is this is like a time dependent CPA version. Time which dependent CPA, doesn't yeah. capture Anderson localization, for instance. No. So with this approach, I, I can't really make the statement. That's why I say this is really far fetched. Uh, it, but, it is uh, time dependent CPA, but time dependent CPA, if you have a bimodal distribution of disorder, can give you, in fact, the metal insular transition itself, which I think is something that is currently under study and not completely known. So there are lots of interesting open questions, anyway. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Let's see how many people are left. All right. Um, well, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I will be back next week, I think, for the seminar. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Publication again yes. for questions. And yeah. Be in touch about the uh, the YouTube video. Yeah. All right. Maybe you can send me the link and then I can have a look how that mm -hmm. how that looks like. Yeah, I think it's very good as usual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, with okay. that.